Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> so today what I want to do is try to talk about mob grazing. And I guess mob grazing has prob probably been around for, you know, maybe 10 years. And when you talk to people and about, you know, what is it, no one can give you a real definition. And there was an extension uh, a, uh, agent in Nebraska, Terry Gomper, who did a study, a, a survey of, of producers, and basically, you know, try to g get some information about what that is. And basically, there's, you know, probably it's a, it's a high stocking density from maybe 20 to 25,000 pounds of live weight um, of animals to, to to maybe somewhere up towards a million pounds. And, and so people are moving livestock uh, perhaps once a day to, to several times a day when you start moving to higher stock densities. And <clears throat> with that, one of the targets could be you know, high trampling and, and high consumption of forage. And another component to this, of course, is there's, there's more labor that's involved. And so there's really no... You cannot, no one's made a definition of what it is. Uh, there are people that said it's, an, it's a high stock density or it's an ultra high stock density. And, and perhaps people throw out things like, well, yeah, to, you know, 25,000 pounds of live weight per acre is really kind of a, a souped up managed intensive grazing. And so really you've got to be up towards that 200,000, 300,000, things like that. But when there's really no standard def definition and no, um, no, no group has come up with that definition. So basically, I, I, I just kind of showcase it as, as really shared characteristics. <clears throat> Usually when you're talking to, to people about mob grazing or you're listening to gurus talk about mob grazing, they're really talking about probably two things. And one is what they call a landscaping, um, where you're trying to improve the probably the soil health and the vegetation of that land. So the idea is kind of of reclamation. So there may be land that had been beat up in the past, and you're really looking at trying to use the livestock in an intensive way to try to to get more of that uh, litter and that biomass, above ground biomass, and, and try to trample it with livestock and get it in contact with that soil surface so you can let all that soil biota uh, do its work and try to, to add organic matter to that to that soil surface. And and it also in that process we're we're hearing people are are making improvements um, with that livestock action uh, adding diversity uh, to their systems. Another aspect of, about what's happening with as you increase that stocking density, uh, what we're finding is that we're actually getting increased harvest efficiency. So um, that translates to a higher carrying capacity. So what I mean about um, harvest efficiency is that it's that percentage of the forage that's produced, how much of that goes down the throat of the animal. So in range systems, rangeland people, we talk about utilization. And utilization is actually the disappearance of that vegetation, not that has part to do with consumption, but it's also disappearance that's lost um, through uh, maybe destructive forces such as trampling and consumption by wildlife and insects and those kind of things, and the natural weathering process. And so we've, in, in um, more semi-arid and arid systems where perhaps um, people have been using more season-long continuous grazing when you have very large pastures. We've talked about concepts of take half, leave half, so that we're aiming for a 50% utilization. And that means uh, we're leaving 50% of that biomass for plant vigor, for that plant community to sustain itself. And so what's actually happening if we leave 50% and take 50%, really only half of that half that we're taking is actually going down the throat. So in our very um, conventional systems under season-long continuous grazing, moderate stocking, we're only getting about 25% harvest efficiency. So when you have that assumption and you make your calculations, 
uh, we can set that stocking rate. And so um, societies like the Society for Range Management that works with um, ranchers and, and range professionals, we've developed these kind of safety valves where we know in our in, in the way in the rangeland ecology that we can sustain that rangeland uh, with a season-long continuous grazing model or system with taking a 25% harvest efficiency results in actually 50% utilization and because we were, we're having some of that forage that's disappearing by insects and wildlife and then we're, we're, we're maintaining that, um, that plant community integrity with a 50% utilization. And so what we're finding is actually that mob grazing is kind of ignoring this take half, leave half rule and just blowing past that. And we're getting much higher um, efficiencies of harvest. And so I'm going to show that uh, we're actually getting somewhere towards 35, maybe 40, 50, 60 percent e harvest efficiency. And, and that is not in a season-long continuous system. So I'll have to bring together these concepts of, of use and then rest periods that happens with the mob grazing. So this study uh, was funded through a research and education SARE grant. And we had um, uh, several producers that uh, were contacted and were interested in, in developing this. These producers were already doing mob grazing. And uh, what, what I wanted to do was to kind of come alongside them and say, you know, we're not going to ask you to do anything different than you're doing. What we'd like to do is actually document what you're doing so that we can share that with, with the public and kind of understand, um, you know, what is mob grazing for some people in South Dakota. And actually, this also had some other additional funding with it with, a, with a, an NRCS CIG grant where we, we partnered with some with some people in Nebraska. So there's actually five other locations in Nebraska where, that were kind of following similar, similar protocols. So you can see we've got a nice uh, gradient across the state of South Dakota on the east side across the west and we had a, a few partners up in the, in the north and kind of in this region close to Aberdeen. And if you, go, if you look across South Dakota on the, on the I-29 quarter on the eastern part of South Dakota, we're probably 23 inch rainfall and you get out towards Rapid City, and then we're around 15 to 17. So in the middle of the state, they're probably around between 17 and 20 and further out. So we've got a nice uh, understanding of that rainfall and how that looks in terms of the vegetation. And we're going to see that people are adapting to that, and they're doing things differently because of that. So this is a stocking density kind of characterizing what people are doing in terms of the um, thousands of pounds of beef per acre. So we've got a couple of these sites. Um, the New Underwood site and the Quinn site are out west. Quinn is by Wall, South Dakota, and the New Underwood is just by Rapid City. And so you can see their stocking densities are somewhere around 20 to 25,000. And as you uh, move towards the east, then we're, but our, typically what we're finding is there's somewhere around 50,000 pounds uh, per acre is our stocking density. And in 2012, there was a, a, a quite a severe drought, and so that definitely dropped the stocking rate. The one outlier is actually Reliance, and that's actually showing on this graph at 300,000. He was actually at a million, and he was doing that just for fun to try to demonstrate what that would look like. So I think he was moving somewhere to 12 or 15 times uh, a day to be able to achieve that. So the he had... I, I want to. I think it was somewhere in the uh, of 300 pair that were on a piece of ground for 45 minutes, and he had set up ahead of time some bat latches so that they were going off on timers, and the, so the cattle were actually moving themselves. And so, and I, and it, and then we had a comparison. There was a, a rotation that uh, that it was just moving once a day or twice a day that at 50,000. So, on, so he kind of has this really extreme. So it's kind of fun to fun to look at. All right, there's a lot of information in this particular slide, so I've got to take you through it to kind of draw out some really important things here. So first of all, what we did is we went and picked four locations with a graduate student where we did some pretty intensive of clipping of vegetation. So we would take a quarter meter square and run several transects, and we would clip all that vegetation 
uh, prior to, to the cattle turning on onto these areas. And then we would, we would get the staining biomass and we'd get the litter, the old litter that was on the ground. And then after the cattle were into that spot and they moved on to another spot, we'd come back and locate those same transects and then we'd put down another quarter meter square, paired that up with the previous one, and then we collected and separated stuff that was newly trampled, the old litter, and the stuff that was left standing. So what we could do by subtraction is kind of get an estimate of disappearance by, of consumption and how much is newly trampled and those kind of things. So the first part that you see, the, the, the darker green, is basically the, the standing biomass of the vegetation before the cattle were put into it. Then the, the gray bar is the post vegetation. And uh, <clears throat> the, the lighter green in the middle, this is the pre-litter that was already existing. And then this is the post, the post litter. And so some of that, and theoretically, should be the same if the cattle aren't eating litter, which you wouldn't expect. So there's going to be a little sampling error there. But one of the things that I want to draw your attention to is this last bar, which would be the trampling. So that's that new litter. And so what I want to show is, is uh, if you make the subtraction, so you're starting with your pre-biomass, and then with your end biomass, if you, if you pull out how much was trampled, then you can get how much was consumed by livestock. And so what I've put down here is the harvest efficiency. So these numbers are the percent of that was down the throat of the existing, the pre-biomass vegetation. So you can see that there's a, 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 vi a wide variety, but, you, but it's more than our typical, um, if we planned a season-long continuous grazing at moderate levels, that's at base 25%. So why, why these producers are doing this is because they're getting, uh, with this intensive stocking densities, up to that 25 to 50,000 to 200 or maybe a million, is, is they're getting higher harvest efficiencies. So to put this in perspective, if you think about in western South Dakota with our, our stocking rates are about a half a AUM per acre. And that translates to probably a, a stocking density for a six month grazing season. That's less than 500 pounds of live weight per acre. And if you come over to the east side of the state where we have stocking rates somewhere maybe one and a half to maybe two AUMs per acre, at a traditional rotation, you might be at five, you know, moving cattle once a week, we might be at 5,000 pounds per acre of live weight. And so what we're seeing is even though when we go up to 25,000 pounds, that doesn't seem like a lot, but it's, you know, it's probably five times more intensive than our, our typical rotations that we used to be doing you know, when we're starting to move livestock once a day. And so one of our producers that, that's by Haytai, you know, he was moving um, cattle twice a day, and his, his stocking densities were closer to that 200,000. The Chamberlain was around 50,000 pounds per acre. So part of it is going to be the vegetation. So what we've been finding is that in, it, it, as the vegetation is shorter and in a vegetative state, they tend not to trample as much because it's sparser, thin, and what they're doing is they're consuming more. And it's actually hard to get uh, newly trampled. So out at this Quinn site, you know, we're, we've, we've got about uh, uh, maybe 20% um, of that is getting trampled. And, and, and interestingly enough, at the, at the Ch Chamberlain site, <clears throat> you know, they're not trampling that much. But at Haytai, um, they were getting a little bit more trampled. And the Haytai site uh, a little was about or about the same as productivity of the Chamberlain. But it has to do with, you know, if that vegetation gets taller, you know, they're more apt to probably knock some of that down. So from the, there's a, remember the two goals that why people are probably doing this. There's a landscaping goal where you really want to trample that vegetation to try to build soil health, you know, get more land covered. And then there's kind of maybe a, a stocking, uh, carrying capacity, stocking rate, uh, you know, uh, harvest efficiency goal where you're trying to get more consumption and maintaining animal performance. And so in that, sam in that standpoint, then what we're probably meeting, you know, that, those goals from that, that increased harvest efficiency. So this is where the economics play in, that uh, you're spending your time, 
you know, most of the producers probably spend about a half an hour, maybe an hour at most, to move the livestock a day. And it's, it's paying off in terms of they're able to, you know, increase that stocking density um, and, and getting that higher um, harvest efficiency. And so what we're finding is that how, how do they do that if <clears throat> these harvest efficiencies and these utilization rates, remember utilization is basically the consumption plus trampling. And so those are pretty high. Uh, notice if you just calculate uh, utilization, that would be your pre-vegetation uh, minus the post-vegetation and that difference is really high. So a lot of times we're getting 80% utilization. And of that 80%, maybe 40 or so of it is, is down the throat, and the other 40 may be trampled, or you know, there's some proportion of those. And so from a, as a trained person in the range science, that is uh, st stressful because we're thinking, oh, we're blowing past take half, leave half, and, and that can't be good for the plant community is that actually a sustainable practice? So had to wrestle with, with these concepts. So, so here's what's happening. You graze a, a piece of land for one day or for half a day, and you're not coming back to it for a whole year. So they're getting a long rest period. You've got a very intensive you know, utilization, very high, but a lot of rest. So what I like to do to translate what this means to me is, let's, for example, let's say you're, you're harvesting a hay field. Well, we harvest hay pretty much every, at the same time every year. So let's say you have a hay field. It's July 1st. You come in with your sickle bar mower, and you cut it down at you know, a few inches off the ground. You're probably getting 80 90% har harvest efficiency. And we do that for 50, 100 years, whatever. And it comes back, and you get the same productivity every single year. Obviously, there's fluctuations based on you know, rainfall. But that's a sustainable practice because it's always producing about the same amount. So if we switch to these higher stocking density kind of systems where we're only on that piece of ground for half a day or for a day, essentially, we're kind of taking that same concept and, and applying it to livestock. So the livestock are the mower. Yeah, they're not getting 80 or 90 percent of it. They're maybe getting 40 and knocking down 40, or they're getting 60 and knocking down 20. But you get the point that because we have such long rest periods, up to a year, uh, it does not hurt the vegetation. <clears throat> now we know that um, it, it, some of the rest periods, uh, some of that time period, you know, is going to be dormant season. So when we talk about resting for an entire year. Um, there are times when you can rest land in the winter. It does really no good. Um, it's going to be key on what's the growth rate of these plants afterwards. So if you graze these things in a stage where they're the grass is in a boot stage and you hit it hard every year, you're probably going to set it back because plants are most vulnerable in the boot stage. If you wait till the plants are headed out, and graze it that time of year, you're probably not going to hurt the plants uh, because when plants have headed out, they've put down most of, of what they need from the, um, the root structure. So when I think about simplistic way of grazing and what kind of impact am I going to have below ground, is just think about um, when the plant is tall, it's probably tall below ground. When the plant is short, it's probably short below ground. So depending upon when you graze, that's kind of reflective of the impact that you're going to have below ground. So when we graze when the plant is tall, we're not going to hurt it because it's probably set um, a lot of um, you know, root structure. On a side note, I had a grad student that at our Volga site, which was near Brookings, to kind of play around with different stocking densities. So we had our producers where we we let them do what they wanted to do, and, and, and the kind of vary between 25 up to maybe 200,000 pound stocking rate. And so what we wanted to do was look at stocking rates from, from 50,000 pounds up to 800,000 pounds. So what we did is we just, we would put the, enough for one day or two days, or we would go towards you know, moving maybe um, eight times a day or 10 times a day, those kind of things. And so we varied that. And then we did the same thing. We went ahead 
it, into the paddock before they came and clipped the samples, separated into those standing vegetation litter, and then we allowed the, the animals to graze those paddocks, and then we pulled them off, and then we went back to those same areas and put down a sample next to this area that we clipped before, and then we had the new trampled, we had the old litter, and we had the standing vegetation. So what I'm showing you is the, the utilization. So the, remember the utilization is what was, um, is the pre-vegetation and you subtract off the post. So utilization is consumption plus trampling. And in, two, in 2012, we had, that, we had that drought. And so we had uh, some issues, of course, um, didn't want to hurt the grass and, and didn't have as much forage. Uh, and then in 2013, it was a little bit uh, wetter. And so what you see is kind of, is that um, what are we achieving, you know, how much are the cattle eating and knocking things down? And what it, it kind of appears that, is that how much, it's, what stocking density is enough? Is, are, are, is a 50,000 pound stock density enough to, to achieve some of these things? Do you need 100, do you need 200, do you need 400, 800? Because we have producers um, throughout North America that are going from anywhere from that 25 to 50 that maybe are going up to like Dennis, um, uh, Neil Dennis up in Canada that may be up towards a million. And so is, is there kind of this law of diminishing returns is like how much is enough? And so what we found is that, you know, in that, that there's a, you know, it, it, an increase in utilization then it kind of levels off. And the same kind of thing here is that there's, there's only so much you can do. And so what we're finding out is that, you know, yeah, maybe, um, you know, at 50,000 pounds, depending upon the, the vegetation we're, where we're at, you know, maybe 200,000 pounds is, an, is enough in that, and that may be moving twice a day in, in higher rainfall environments. But 200,000 pounds of stocking weight or live weight in Western environments with less vegetation, you have to move several times a day. <clears throat> so... And then part of the other thing was just to kind of compare this to, to folks that are doing mob grazing. So at some of the sites, they had uh, a comparison that we could do with mob grazing. And here, this is just ocular estimates of, of the grass cover. So it wasn't, the veg it wasn't clipping the vegetation, but we would make these ocular estimates of before and after. And, and so what I'm showing you, again, is the, is the before. You would go into the paddock and then the after. And then you can make those subtractions to get at that utilization and, and kind of consumption things. And so what we're showing here is that, yeah, they're getting more, they're getting more utilization compared to the rotation with the mob grazing, same thing. So when you just look at mob versus rotation. So, so the bottom line is, you know, again, just reiterating, why are people wanting to do this? Why are they intensifying this uh, rotational grazing with this mob grazing? And it really comes comes down to it is that um, they're gaining a higher harvest efficiency. There's that uh, higher, we're, we're, we're getting higher utilization, but it's a safe practice because we're only on that piece of land for just one day and it gets to be rested the other parts of the year. So here are some just some pictures of before and after. Um, so this is uh, a 57,000 pounds stock density just you know uh, moving once a day, so that's what it looks like. Uh, another graduate student looked at some uh, some of the uh, the weeds, and so we looked at uh, western snowberry, which is a native shrub, and we also looked at some of the um, the, the thistles. And w as you increase that stocking density, cattle then tend to 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 utilize some of those broadleaf plants that they normally wouldn't do. So that's part of it as well. This is the one that was at uh, uh, Reliance, uh, a sandy soil where he um, grazed at that million pounds. They were only on, that, on a piece of land for, um, I think it was a third of an acre, 45 minutes with a 300 pair. And so they really trampled it and really high distribution of, of, um, of dung. And then the, there's where the, the rotation for 12 hours on 55,000. So you get a much higher utilization. So here's new percent new litter cover. This is again an ocular. The the one that was um, Quinn and the um, the new Underwood sites are really far west, and so only five percent, maybe ten percent new litter. These are areas that were receiving 15 inches of rainfall, 
and it's just darn hard to get new litter. I mean, when you're there, there's a lot of space in between plants. So can mob grazing be used for landscaping in semi-arid, arid environments? It's very challenging because there's not a lot of biomass to begin with, and, to, and to, in order to maintain performance, there's not much to trample. And this is dung uh, density, so we, we looked at the uh, paths per meter square. And so that's one of the things is that the, we're, we're increasing utilization and getting more evenly distribution of density of, of the excrement. We had a couple tours for, for the researchers on the project in, 20, in 2012 and 2013. And we also made some videos. Um, if you want to just go to the South Dakota Grassland Coalition, sdgrass.org. Um, you can find these videos. You can search, you can Google them, or go onto YouTube and you'll find them. Uh, Pat Guptill is the one by Quinn, uh, Charlie Totten's by Chamberlain, and then Rick Smith is by Watertown, and those are available to look at. So bottom line is producers are getting a higher harvest efficiency. We've also taken soil samples to document carbon but we haven't got all our soil samples analyzed, and so we're, we're still waiting for those. But what I would say is that I don't expect soil carbon to probably increase. That's a, a slow process, especially you think about those western environments where there's not a lot of new litter being added. It's, that's not the mechanism for it to happen when you're only getting 5% new litter on the ground. It much makes a lot more sense that you probably can increase soil carbon as you move further east where there's a lot of biomass and you can get it trampled on the ground. Does that make sense? So my guess is that we're going to see these benefits um, return to us from the higher harvest efficiency to pay for the labor and make, make these ranches more sustainable. And these guys are only doing it for maybe 60 days. Um, it's not sustainable to kill yourself <laughs> working that hard either. And so there's there's reason you know a time period w which which they're doing for. So what we're gonna we're expecting a, a graduate student in the econ department to finish up his thesis here this semester, and then we're gonna be able to put that uh, economic analysis that he'll do uh, um, when we write our final report. So the question is how many how big are the paddocks? So they'll range they're typically uh, five acres uh, of what uh, and then it's just depending upon how many pair. So the one by uh, uh, Chamberlain, he would give four to five acres and he'd have 250 pair. Um, the one producer that's in, uh, by Selby, he's actually here today. Uh, he's, I think he's around four or five acres and that same kind of thing. So they're at that 50,000 pound stocking density. So the question was, did the, did the producers increase their overall stocking rate for the year? And I would say for yes, for that piece of ground, they are increasing their stocking rate, their carrying capacity. So these typically are, are older crop, our crop land long time ago been planted back to, to introduce species, and they're purposely getting more bang for the buck on that spot. There are some, the one in Reliance, it was native, or not Reliance, the one by uh, Chamberlain was native. And we think with, uh, with the system that he's doing, he's probably a two and a half times higher than the typical NRCS recommended take half, leave half for season long. So we are getting higher stocking rates for those pieces of land. And it was mostly um, not virgin native. Most of them are these old crop land that was in the West. It's crested. Like mono species or. Yep, yeah, crested wheat, species. crested wheatgrass, alfalfa out west, intermediate wheat gra wheatgrass, um, brome grass kind of things, Kentucky bluegrass in the central. The one in Haytai by Watertown, Rick Smith, it's a, a planted back a blue stem, big blue stem kind of thing. And, and so what they're doing is they're intensifying on land that can handle that. But remember, it's getting rested for right. a, essentially a year. And then how do the animals perform? Like how so they're watching body condition. We didn't have weights, and most people don't take the weights. But I, you can tell the producers that they're doing this for 30 days or 60 days, and then they kind of go back to a rotation where they're getting moved, you know, once a month, once a week, twice a week kind of thing. So they can, cows can compensate, there's compensatory gain. 
So even if they're challenged a little bit for 30 days or 60 days, you'll find that they will make that up in, in a later period. So it's mostly cows. It's mostly, mo cow -calf yep, cow everybody that we're working with are, are cow-calf pairs oh. except Pat Guptill that he's got um, bred heifers. And I should mention Gary, that's um, Cliff Millsaps over by Gary. He's got steers, so he's around 17,000 pound stock density, and he's actually moving through maybe two to three times a year. So he wants to make sure he has good animal performance to put gain on steers. So there's two people that have yearlings, every else is cow-calf pair.